All right, thanks. Um, so it's going to be a little challenging to dis discuss and kind of go over everything regarding ICP in such a sh short session, but I'll try to kind of hit the highlights as far as what is probably the, the best things to keep in mind as you're going on your sub interns and uh, um, your junior internship and residency. So brief overview, biomechanics of ICP, and then we'll talk a little bit about the medical and surgical management thereof. And I think one of the most important um, considerations when talking about ICP is uh, thinking about the concept of the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. And what this is, is essentially the concept that, you know, the brain is housed within a fixed space, the skull. And things within the brain, you either have your brain itself, cerebral spinal fluid, arterial blood, or venous blood. And the, the skull being so rigid and firm, everything else kind of either increases or decreases. And based on that, your pressure can go up um, if you increase the volume within the brain other than um, what's normally there. And so the things that would normally um, be squished out first would be your CSF and your venous volume because these things can um, change a certain amount without there being detrimental neurologic um, sequelae. And so the patient may not notice. So if you have an increasing mass, you might have a compensated state where the ICP is normal. However, at some point you eliminate all the CSF from the intracranial vault and you decrease all the venous um, blood volume. And then the brain itself, you can't really get rid of without having neurologic def uh, deficits and arterial volume for similar reasons. Arteries are a little bit more rigid and can't be compressed as much as veins. And in addition to that, um, you decrease your cerebral perfusion pressure and thus you might start developing strokes and things like that. Things that can increase your um, ICP, um, cerebral edema, either from tumors or strokes or um, if you have hyperglycemia related uh, or hyponatremia related metabolic reasons for having increased edema. Hydrocephalus, when you have obstruction or non-communicating hydrocephalus, as well as communicating forms of hydrocephalus that can increase your um, CSF volume can also increase your ICP. And then bleeds such as epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, intracranial hemorrhages can increase the sheer mass within the intracranial vault, increasing your pressure there as well. And then things such that impair your venous outflow. So a uh, rare form of pseudotumor cerebri or benign intracranial hypertension is one that is caused by venous outflow atresia. So your transverse or sigmoid sinuses might be narrowed um, or atretic, and that can actually cause increased intracranial pressure and cause uh, pseudotumor cerebri in thin patients, for example. And this is just a picture of the skull. And you know, compared to the skull, the brain is like tofu. And as a result, anything that increases um, the sheer volume within the brain will push on the brain. And as a result, you get your herniation syndromes that you learn about and you're studying for your step twos, your epidural hematomas and whatnot can cause transtentorial herniation, subfalcine herniation, central herniation, et cetera, et cetera. And so in order to prevent those things from happening, we always try to maintain a normal amount of intracranial pressure. Now this varies. When you're upright, your intracranial pressure might even be negative. When you're lying flat and valsalving, your intracranial pressure might go beyond 20. But it's the spectrum and the median intracranial pressure from zero to 20 that you're really um, trying to maintain a happy medium for. When you start increasing your intracranial pressure, the compliance of the brain changes. So say that you're constipated and you're trying to pass uh, bowel movement, your intracranial pressure probably increases to about 30, 35, but your brain has a good compliance and you're probably in this um, kind of zero um, to one, more along the good compensatory curve. And so you don't have undue side effects of brain herniation, et cetera. The CSF gets squished out, the venous volume gets squished out. So you're doing pretty well. As you have things like brain tumors or cerebral hemorrhages that kind of decrease the reserve of cerebral compliance, then you start getting to this exponential zone where when you valsalva, it can really 
cause neurologic sequelae, it can cause herniation syndromes, and so your compliance um, isn't as good. So any small increases in intracranial pressure will, or any increases um, in the volume of the brain will cause a sharp increase um, in the intracranial pressure. And this is kind of what it looks like when, if you were to have a, a ICP monitor or a ventriculostomy, initially you have this good compliance and this is your normal ICP monitor um, waveforms where you have a percussion wave where you have the um, blood pressure that kind of pulsates in and then you have this kind of uh, tidal wave where things start to go down nicely um, with the closure of the, the aortic valve, etc. But when you start losing that compliance, you kind of get this inverse wave where the second peak actually is higher than the first peak and this suggests that you're having um, decreased compliance. So this is something to watch out for when you see patients with ICP monitors, if you start seeing this inversion of this wave, you know that they're starting to get on that um, uh, kind of the sinusoidal portion um, where it's exponential and having decreased um, intracranial compliance, and they might be at a closer point of herniation, so it's something to keep an eye out for. As far as the medical management and for being a sub-eye and an intern, the first and foremost thing that you can do is if you can raise their head of the bed, raise the head of the bed. I think this is something that's overlooked very quickly. You know, patients are in the trauma unit, they're getting intubated and people forget to raise the head of bed. But this is really the thing that you need to make sure happens. If they're on spine precautions, do reverse Trendelenburg. But first and foremost, think about this. And this is really where you can kind of save lives as a medical student, as an intern, because by doing so, you drop their intracranial pressure about 10 to 15 centimeters of water. Um, and if you're not thinking about this, this could be the difference between um, you know, bad neurologic outcomes versus not. Particularly when you're in the OR and you're positioning for a hemicrany. Anesthesia intubates, they're flat, make sure you raise the head of bed. Sedation, by doing this, you decrease their um, sympathetic tone as well as their metabolic um, demand helping the intracranial pressure. Hyperventilation can cause vasoconstriction. So you ask for an end tidal CO2 of about 30. This is something that you should be doing transiently in an acute phase. If you do this long-term, you can decrease the amount of cerebral um, blood flow. So this is not something that you should do for many, many, many days, but you know, initially it's something to consider. And then hyperosmolar treatment, either through mannitol or hypertonic saline. And then finally, ventriculostomy. We all know this picture, you know, we go through Coker's point, um, aim at the nasion and the tragus, and in doing so, we're able to pass this catheter um, and different illustrations, but this allows us to drain that CSF um, and therefore decrease the intracranial pressure. Now, major tenants, really, you're trying to maintain blood flow um, and O2 by um, allowing the cerebral perfusion pressure to continue and preventing brain squishing. Now, the surgical management, we either do decompressive hemicraniectomies, removing that vault of the bone, allowing for um, pressure to be relieved. We can alleviate the pressure by removing the inciting cause of intracranial pressure, such as the epidural, subdural, or ICH, um, and elevate depressed small fractures. So these are clinical cases. For the sake of time, I won't go into all the, the sequelae, or sorry, the neurologic exam and everything, but patient is doing very poorly and has a low GCS, and you see this large subdural hematoma with a lot of midline shift and subpulsing herniation. Take this patient to the OR, do a reverse question mark incision, and you can see that this is this is stellate incision, and this is where the dura used to be, and you can see that the brain is pooching out beyond the level of the bone and dura, and by doing this and closing the skin over this, we allow this brain to expand afterwards, and you can see with the removal of the um, hematoma that things are improving, and the shift is improved. This is Just to interrupt case. really quickly, uh, we have four minutes left and I've posted the links to the next uh, session breakouts um, in the chat. Um, so you guys can click on that whenever the time's up. Right, Please proceed. Thanks. thanks. And another patient that's doing well, very we poorly. We want to leave some time for some questions. Uh, yeah. This is an excellent last. talk. If I could just interject, you know, one, you, one, you can see uh, Dr. Kim's a great teacher. You know, as a sub eye, you're going to be shadowing a, a resident down to the uh, emergency room and seeing patients, and you're not going to have a ventriculostomy or an ICP monitor in 
person. Some of the things that you should look at are the basal cisterns. Look at that CT scan. If the basal cisterns are effaced, that patient probably has high CP. If they have a dilated pupil, then they probably have herniation. Um, if you're seeing a patient with hydrocephalus, um, look in their eyes, uh, see if they have papilledema. These are all basic clinical exam, uh, radio imaging interpretation things that uh, you can then take some of those actions or, or recommend some of those actions that Dr. Kim was, rec uh, was demonstrating. Absolutely. And in addition to that, I think, that, sorry, I didn't have any pictures of basal cisterns, but this one also demonstrates, you know, with the cerebral edema, you start seeing that the, there's haziness as far as the differentiation between the, the gray and white matter just due to um, kind of edema and uh, cytotoxic edema. In addition to that, also look at the sagittal uh, CT scan, and sometimes you can see evidence of, you know, tonsillar descent from the increase in cranial pressure. So, yes, those are all very important radiographic findings to look for. Any questions in the last two minutes? Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.